Warning! Today's story contains intense comic book violence, including death, and moral quagmires. It's not for children. Escape Pod 49 April 13th, 2006 Today's story, Union Dues, of White Lies, by Jeffrey R. D. Rangel. Hi, I'm Steve Ely, and welcome again to Escape Pod. We bring you the best in short science fiction and fantasy, so you can keep your eyes on the road. This intro is a blatant plug for writers, so if you don't care about writing SF, feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes. If you are a writer, and I'm guessing that a non-trivial number of you are, I've been meaning to tell you about Viable Paradise 10 before it's too late. It's an intense week-long workshop held in October this year on Martha's Vineyard. Attendance is limited to 24 students, and there are 8 instructors, all of them professionals such as Cory Doctorow and James Patrick Kelly, and Patrick and Teresa Nielsen Hayden from Tor. If your language skills completely trump your math skills, that's a 3 to 1 student-teacher ratio. I'm an alumnus of Viable Paradise. I went to VP2 back when it was still almost unknown. As circumstances worked out, there were four students on the island that year and five instructors, so it was a pretty high exposure week. I can tell you from my own experience, the story critiques and the formal sessions were great. Some of the advice I still keep very close to me, but to me the real learning experiences were the downtime ones. Simply hanging out with successful writers, seeing how they view the world. It's mind-opening stuff. And, of course, Martha's Vineyard is one of the most beautiful places to have a workshop. If you haven't stood atop a cliff with the wind blowing and the sun glaring off the ocean and had Jim McDonald lecture you with passionate force about not knowing your story's theme, you've still got things to learn about it. If this sounds like your cup of joe, applications are open until June 15th. Go to VibleParadise.org to learn more. The 10th anniversary reunion is also happening right after the workshop this year, so there's a chance I might even see you there. Good luck, and watch out for the thing. And now for this week's story. Last November, we ran a story called Iron Bars in the Glass Jaw. Long-time Escape Pod listeners won't have forgotten it. Our informal poll at the end of the year voted it the favorite story of 2005. It was the first in a series by debut author Jeffrey R. Durego called Union Dues, presenting a superhero universe that's morally complex and asks some hard questions about how people above society can serve it. We had an overwhelming call for more stories in the Union Do series, and so, at long last, we present the second entry in the saga, Off-White Lies. This is Mr. Durego's third appearance in Escape Pod, and once again, this story has never previously appeared anywhere else. The story is read for us this week by Mr. Intensity himself, Scott Sigler, the author of podcast novels Earthcore, Ancestor, and Infection. If nonstop sci fi horror action is your bag, you owe it to yourself to go to his site at scottsigler.net and fill that bag full of Sigler. Meanwhile, assemble your team and stand by for orders. It's story time. Union Dues Off White Lies by Jeffrey R. Durego. The first thing that hits you is the cold, like a scalpel cutting skin, or a dentist drill striking an active nerve. The wind howls like a pack of wolves, even through the titanium armor and electric heat of the jump jet, it gnaws at you. I fought the uncontrollable shivers, tugged my parka tight around my chest, and walked to the hatch. The village was here somewhere, obscured by blinding white landscape, wind-carved rises of millennial ice. Damn it! Someone was supposed to meet me! I held the headset microphone clumsy in thick mittens. Can you contact Village Control and find out what's going on? Sure, hang on. A second of static, barely audible over the roar of jump jet exhaust. Someone's coming up now. Thanks. A moment later, a figure in a blazing red parka clambered over a rise of ice. It paused, then waved. I jogged to meet it as the jet quickly lifted off for the return trip to Australia. I met the red parka and followed it down a ladder carved from the ice to a black hatchway and stepped through before it was pulled closed behind me. The heat lock was only about 20 degrees, but I stripped the parka quickly and hung it along a row of similar suits. The jump in temperature forced a fast and uncomfortable sweat to seep through into the lining of my green costume and half-face mask. She was tall, 
nearly seven feet, without her boots, and I recognized her immediately. Sindel, the super strong former leader of the first team of the New York Pyramid. I produced a small black folder, flashing her the picture and credentials inside. Welcome to the village, she said in a flat, emotionless voice. We've been expecting you. Thanks. She led me to an identical hatch at the other end of the heat lock. This was my first visit. The Union rarely discusses what goes on within this ice-bound sanctuary. I knew it was where the supers who refused to be recruited were housed and fed, I assumed under comfortable conditions. If the living was bad, well, all the occupants had to do was ask, and the Union would welcome them into any one of the fifty pyramids stretched across America. How long have you been here? We passed into a long, warm corridor lit with flickering fluorescent bulbs, and she turned to face me. Three years. Three years too long. I didn't answer. I knew she had been sent as an administrator, perhaps against her will. Once she was a team leader, third in line for leadership of the New York Pyramid. Her personal comics and action figures topped the sales charts, but she cracked and became unstable. She began tackling situations single-handed, keeping her team in support positions. Clear violation of union procedure. Her team knew that she was beginning to fray. Nervous breakdowns aren't all that uncommon, given the stress of the job, and the rate is triple for team leaders. The union has psychiatrists and telepaths for such cases, but Sindel didn't respond well to treatment. She developed post-traumatic stress disorder, lashing out at her own team, and worse, at the normals. Her merchandising was kept active, but Sindel herself was retired. Usually this means going into some administrative or marketing job, or recruit training, Sindel was sent here, to the village, as far from the public eye as you could get, and just one step up from being an inmate. I didn't blame her for being resentful. We reached the administrative offices. Hers was a large room, littered with exercise equipment, a single desk, and a terminal. A battered copy of the charter hung over her desk. So what is it that I can do for the union? I handed her a single sheet of paper containing a list of names. All of them had arrived within the last year. Recruiting trip? She glanced up from the paper and met my shielded eyes. Yes, I need to speak with each of them in private. The smell of stale perspiration permeated the office. I fought the growing urge to gag. Is there a free conference room I can use? Yes, downstairs. She stretched back into her chair and sighed. Mind if I offer some advice? No, any insight you offer would be helpful. Leave. Just go. A recruiting visit was here just three weeks ago, and they had no success. The people here don't much like the union. Hell, it took me almost a year before any of them would even speak to me, and I didn't try to razzle-dazzle them. She quickly scanned the list and produced folders matching each name. Here, she slid them across the desk. But they won't go with you. The union tries very hard to get all supers to sign on and become active members, but some simply won't. This is the first village, and already the Union is constructing others. Either the mutation rate is rising among the normals, or we're getting better at ferreting them out. Either way, we need more space. You don't think so? She laughed and waved across the common area visible through her office window. And give up all of this? They know this is it. The end. That they can never see their families or friends ever again. That they are officially dead. The disgust in her voice was nearly tangible. I'm sorry you feel that way. It's not human. Well, neither are we. Sindel didn't answer. Now, can you show me to the office? I had wandering rights within the complex and spent the first full day mingling with the villagers. All of them made tremendous effort to avoid speaking with me. The village had all the amenities. A well-furnished dining hall, library, computers, television lounges, and a non-denominational chapel. There were 400 villagers living here, but I was hard-pressed to find any group larger than three. They wore normal clothes, which looked strange to me after having lived with the costume for such a long time. I had to force myself to remember that there were no aliases here. The village had been set up in Antarctica to make escape virtually impossible. A hundred miles of windswept ice surrounded the complex in every direction. Helicopters and jump jets were the only means of arrival or departure. Food and other supplies were airdropped. The staff was made up of old and decommissioned personalities from other Union pyramids. 
Most of them came here by choice, too old to serve on an active team, but afraid of the lethargy of retirement. Someone from the Union proper visited every six months to ensure that conditions were adequate and comfortable. The staff was housed in a cloistered wing separate from the village population. It was unquestionably a prison. 2. I studied the dossier laid out in the desk that dominated the small office. Maria Fidalgo sat nervously across from me. She was a telepath, desperately trying not to read my thoughts. A mask of false apathy stretched across her heart-shaped face. In any other place, she would have been cute, if not beautiful. But with no reason to show it off, she maintained an aloof and disinterested air. I don't want to join the Union. I said that a year ago. I understand. Can I go now? Not just yet. I glanced at the dossier again. Why didn't you choose to join the Union when it was offered to you? Some of the villagers were here for religious reasons. Mutants born to Amish or Quakers who refused to engage in violence under any circumstances. I did not need them. My targets were the active objectors, the ones who had a real axe to grind. Superhero bullshit. Her voice remained cold and distant. She was only 16. By the time the Union learned of her existence, she had already spent five of her years in a reform school. Shoplifting, assault on a student at your high school, petty theft. I even heard that you enticed someone to give you a brand new car, which you sold to a chop shop. So? So when the Union came for you, you told them to go screw. Yeah, and they sent me here. Why didn't they just leave me alone? She was projecting. My mind began to cloud, just for a moment, and then it subsided, as if her influence was being withdrawn. Because they can't. A definite problem with authority. Good. I paused, then changed the conversation. I could still feel her mind, like wispy tendrils caressing my thoughts and memories. I was unable to force her out. Do you like it here? It's a prison. My head swirled for a moment, and I could see the village through her eyes. Lethargic inmates mindlessly wandering the complex. Boredom and depression washed over me first, then resentment and jealousy. It faded almost instantly, and the clarity of the vision had been incredible. You have complete freedom inside. All the television you can watch, all the food you can eat. I'm sure there's plenty of sex here, and lots of like-minded folks who can bitch and moan with you about how unfair life is. Sounds like paradise to me. Prison is prison no matter how comfortable it is on the inside. And I ain't joining. So can I go? She stood and glared at me before walking to the door, which I had locked from a switch on the desk. No. I waited for her to sit. The Union needs you, Maria. We are going through a difficult time at the moment. The normals, it seems, are growing distrustful of us, of our motives. The government has called for open access to our pyramids, our records, and our personnel files. And we can't let that happen. The normals want the power to amend the charter and use us as a resource for military development. In some respects, we have become an enemy. That much, I'm sure you understand. She didn't answer. They see our pyramids, our comics, and our cartoons, and they're resentful. Perhaps even afraid. We exist as a separate nation within the United States, like an independent peacekeeping force. Some politicians see us as a military threat. Religious leaders see us as a moral threat. And entertainment companies see us as a monetary threat. They have nothing to focus on, no other crisis to worry about. So, they worry about us. So? Her face betrayed growing interest. So the Union needs an enemy. A force of chaos to counterbalance the Union's order. Someone the public can see, and see them fighting with. Sometimes winning, sometimes losing. They need a superhuman threat. A small group to take the pressure off and put the Union in a better light. My team will be that enemy, Maria. Your team? Only the active members of the Tribunal know about this project. The Union has already built a facility to house us with a modern training area and rooms much more comfortable than this. The Charter is irrelevant to this group, as are the Union rules and hierarchy. Our job will be to make trouble as loudly and as chaotically as we can, but we can't purposely kill the normals. We can destroy their buildings, smash their cars, sink their ships, but we cannot kill them. We will be paid regular union wages, plus whatever we can steal. I paused. Her interest had been piqued, and she was again in my mind. Sound like something that interests you? 
I caught the last image she projected, barely and out of focus. It was of union members broken and dead, their costumes torn, blood, fire. A wave of happiness washed over me, and then she was gone. Her will retracted, safe in the hollow of her skull. I decided to forget that for now. There would be time to channel that energy later. Don't worry, we'll take care of everything. She smiled, and I knew Maria Fidalgo was one of us. The others were just as easy to recruit, and two days ahead of schedule, I had assembled a small team with tremendous potential. I had them restricted to quarters until the jet returned. I was eating dinner alone when Sindel, dressed in jeans and a sweatshirt, met me. Mind if I join you? She had already dropped her tray of tofu-fortified meatloaf and whipped potatoes. Nope. Word in the village is you've had some success. She wore a classic poker face, and I was unable to determine how much she knew, if she knew anything at all. Some. Pity there isn't room for all of them, though I'm surprised you had any luck. What'd you do? Promise them a million dollars each as a signing bonus? She laughed, but it died off. Any, uh, any chance you could use a veteran? I know the tribunal isn't interested, but I hear what you're recruiting for is something different, very hush-hush. Yeah, it is. I stared at her for a moment. Her hostility was growing. I could feel it. I bristled for a second. Sorry, you aren't qualified. The hell I ain't. Her voice escaped as a prolonged hiss. She pushed the plate aside. I never wanted to be a goddamn prison warden. Her eyes stabbed into mine, and the conversation became a battle of who would flinch first. Look at you. What are you? I remained silent. A goddamn union stooge. The Emerald Blaze. Second youngest strategist ever rescued. Yeah, I do my homework too. I know all about you. Comic grosses of a half mil a year. Action figures twice that. Let me tell you something, Blaze. I was doing your goddamn job when you were still in diapers. Here you are, happily doing their bidding without question. A good soldier, totally blind to the suffering of people here. And you know what the worst thing is? You know what makes my blood boil to even think of you taking some of them away? She forced herself not to pound the table into splinters. It's that you're leaving and I'm staying here. I hate the union more than anyone on that list because I was in it. And look where it got me. A lifetime of babysitting in this shithole. I'm still useful, damn it. I should have this chance. I earned it. You had your choice, Sindel, and you blew it. The pressure was too much for you. You don't know shit. Her voice was strangely calm. No? I know you freaked out once, twice, three times. Put the credibility of the union in jeopardy. Put your team in jeopardy. And put the normals in jeopardy. All because it was all too hard. You got lucky when you came in as an administrator. I know plenty of us that would rather have had you as a villager. Your problems cost all of us the lives of a few friends. Don't waste my time with this self-pity crap, because I've heard it all before. You're going to piss away your energy being angry. At least be angry at the person that brought you here. Be angry at yourself. She stood, turning her muscular back to me. By now, most of the villagers who could squeeze into the perimeter of the hall were there, curiously watching, waiting to see if we came to blows. And I felt for them, because I knew, whatever the outcome of this argument that they would bear the brunt of it once I departed. You think it's so fucking easy, don't you? She turned slowly, fists clenched, face twisted like a kabuki mask. She stopped a nanosecond from leaping over the table at me, having to have an answer for every stupid question some idiot second stringer could think of, having to live up to the goddamn image they marketed for me, as if I wasn't able to be angry or sad or afraid, and if I was, then there was something wrong. Having to watch as my teammates, my friends, died because I wasn't fast enough or strong enough. But none of that's in the comic books. None of that makes it to the Saturday morning cartoon. That stupid green costume of yours. That's the ideal, isn't it? Invented by the marketing department, with no way for you to live up to it, and no way to escape it. You wait. The same thing will happen to you. Then maybe you'll understand. The first time the shit hits the fan, and you have to take the fall. The first time someone dies under your guidance, there's no way out. She turned back again, unclenching her fists, and strode from the dining hall, leaving me with a cold plate of meatloaf and a sour stomach. 3. 
The facility was located 30 miles north of New York City, in the pastoral Ohio Valley. It served a dual purpose. The visible portion of the building was built as a prison, where the Union would incarcerate us after we were captured, where the press could come for pictures of us languishing within the confines of the cells that lined the central fortress-like prison. Beneath it, however, was a large state-of-the-art gymnasium, weight room, regular residences, specialized hospital, and the planning meeting hall, everything you'd find in a typical Union pyramid. A smart group of Union second stringers were sent to the prison to help my team train under the ruse that they were being groomed to staff a new pyramid. We were required to wear black uniforms and masks at all times. For the first two weeks, the team spent 10 hours in the various training rooms. The remaining hours were divided between psychological conditioning, eating, and sleeping. We were exhausted, but growing more confident with each passing hour. Maria, who had once struggled to keep from peering into my mind, now casually slipped in and out of my teammate's cerebral cortex, planted suggestions, created desires, and dug secrets from the deepest recesses of gray matter. Harold Aquino, 600 pounds of rippling, mutated muscle and titanium-hard bone, balanced two tons of steel on the palms of his massive hands while hopping on one foot. Harold had secured a fellowship to Cambridge University when over a two-week period he gained 450 pounds and an inability to control his strength. He blamed the Union for squelching his opportunity to study literature and philosophy at one of the greatest universities in the world. Cheryl Mardukas, super agile and super flexible, flittered and twirled around the high balance beams 50 feet from the concrete floor, leaping from one bar to another with barely a sound. She had mastered Kung Fu midway through the first week. Cheryl's abilities manifested just after her 14th birthday. She turned freelance not long after, and when finally captured by a union team in Chicago, refused to work under the harsh rules and regulations that govern nearly every aspect of union life. Stephen Iria crackled and snapped as bolts of electricity flickered around his slender, hairless body. Then, glancing at me with his white, pupilless eyes, he formed a massive globe of electrical energy and casually tossed it towards the far wall. Stephen came from a broken home. His mother was a heroin addict, his father non-existent. His power manifested when he was 12. He was tossed out of his mother's apartment to live in the street. He was caught shoplifting donuts, and in the process of being arrested, electrocuted three police officers. The tribunal gave me three weeks to whip Maria, Cheryl, Stephen, and Harold into fighting shape. Following the initial training period, the union would deny all knowledge of us and our future activities, and, as Nova described it, deal with us in a substantially theatrical manner. If captured, we were prohibited from divulging anything. The tribunal would see to it that we were returned to our facility. The team grew arrogant and adversarial. It was a deliberate effect of the psychological work. By the third week, the trainers were gone. It was too dangerous for them to remain. We had to be unpredictable. If we acted like the Union, then everyone would suspect that we were part of the Union, and the reason for our existence would backfire. I made a point of letting the team do as they wished, so long as they stayed within the lower level of the compound. Maria and Cheryl had been enemies in the village, but now they held grudging respect. Occasionally, they would even share a table. Stephen and Harold eagerly competed for their affections, but the girls refused them constantly, at least as long as I was present. I made no effort to stop this sort of activity. Intra-team relationships were discouraged in the Union, but it didn't matter to us. If a few carnal diversions brought the team closer, then so be it. If it seemed to get in the way of training, then I would stop it. But so far, it hadn't. We all had minor plastic surgery, just enough so we wouldn't resemble the photos that the Union had on file. Our costumes were identical. Black, top to bottom, with black armored chest plates and full head masks lined with titanium mesh. We would decide on distinguishing costumes later, when marketing had more time to develop credible personalities. But first, I had to plan our debut. 4. I watched the silhouette of the Black Union jump jet cut across the early morning sky. All right, kiddies, I said into the microphone built into my mask. It's showtime. The facade of the First National Bank exploded outward, sending chunks of debris slamming into smoke glass of the skyscraper across the street. A wave of acrid smoke filled the downtown boulevard as my team charged from the wreckage, clutching enormous money-stuffed bags. I knew a bank hit was cliché, but we were new at this villainous routine. I counted six news helicopters slowly circling the plumes of smoke and dust rising from the devastation. 
maximum exposure, just as we'd hoped. We had a special armored car stashed a block away. All we had to do was make a brief stand in the street, then escape, and our work, the Union's work, would be done. I still wasn't sure why they'd sent us so far away from our home base for the debut robbery, but the Union rep, Nova, had made the arrangements. He had us flown in a week earlier, put us up in a hotel two towns away, and scored the armored car for our escape vehicle. I didn't argue. The Union dropped from the rooftops. I recognized them immediately, Ultra Magnus and his team from the Miami Pyramid. I jumped down from my vantage point atop the corner office building. It was only a fall of 20 or so floors. I rolled into the fall and came up unharmed. My costume took the brunt of the impact and dissipated the shock. Okay, remember, this has to be showy. I glanced up at the helicopters, eight of them now, circling like vultures. Pathetic underlings, I grunted, trying to remember the speech patterns of the comic book villains we had trained so hard to become. How dare you oppose our might? My voice was amplified through a small speaker set in the belt buckle at my waist, and I sounded deep and ominous, made more so by the echo effect of the buildings lining the street. Ultra Magnus charged down the street towards us, leaving his allies scrambling in the rear. Watch your backs. There are seven more around here somewhere. Okay, Maria, can you find their strategist? Jesus, I don't know. Her voice, young and terrified. Do it. Scramble the strategist's thoughts. Concentrate. Stephen, can you slow the others down? Will do. A second later, the street was engulfed in thick bolts of blue lightning. I felt the hair on my neck leap upwards and drop face first to the street. One of the police cruisers exploded as the plasma ignited the gasoline in its tank. The ground rumbled. Shrapnel peppered the surrounding offices. When I looked up, Stephen was still standing, but the cops had dropped back, stunned. Ultra Magnus charged. I could see the ripples of granite-hard muscle beneath his red and yellow tights, but his face was weirdly twisted. Not the mask of calm under pressure we knew from the comics. No, he looked like a madman. Nice job, Stephen! Sheesh, snap out of it, people! I sprinted ahead, but Ultra Magnus brushed past me as if I was a mailbox bolted to the street. Harold, his mask like a freight train on two massive stumps of leg, steadied himself, then lifted a police cruiser by the rear axle. He swung it like a two-ton baseball bat and hit the Union first team captain like a fastball. Batter up! Ultra Magnus careened backwards into the lobby of an insurance building across the street. It bought us precious seconds. Plenty of time to escape. All right, kids, they'll be calling for reinforcements if they aren't already here. Maria, any idea where they landed the jet? Two blocks north, a rooftop. I, I don't know which one. His team will be here in no time, so everyone get ready to evacuate. They sounded off happily, as if knocking the Union team leader down was somehow a victory. Ultra Magnus plunged out of the smashed office lobby. Leave it to me! Harold leapt towards the nearest building. His thick trunk-like arms and legs slammed into the concrete five stories up. He climbed looking like a smaller version of King Kong, each fist slamming through the cement, making a new handhold. Chunks of concrete tumbled to the street below. Harold, no! We have to get out of here! That hadn't slowed Ultra Magnus down half as long as I'd hoped. There are more of them around here. I can feel them. I saw another cop car tumble across the sky and slam into the wall above Harold. It held fast there for a second, then teetered back and dropped ten stories down to the sidewalk. Harold followed, crashing thunderously through the wreck and the pavement beneath. Shit! We had the advantage for a moment and should have made our escape. If only I could have had those seconds back. I turned quickly. Ultra Magnus roared like some crazed feral lion. He tore a street lamp from the corner and strode towards me. Okay, time to surrender. That was a good enough show for today. Call it quits before anyone else gets seriously hurt. I turned back towards Maria and Stephen. Okay, kids, it's... The post hit me across the chest, buckling my armor. I dropped to my knees. I couldn't breathe. Hang on, boss! Cheryl's voice echoed through the headset, and she was on him. Her slender frame wrapped legs first around Ultra Magnus's skull. She pounded his cranium with a thick boulder of fallen concrete. Ultra Magnus grunted, 
reached up quickly and grabbed Cheryl by the arm and tore her away. Stephen panicked. Massive arcs of blue plasma erupted from his body. The asphalt beneath his feet melted and pooled around his boots. I heard his screaming. I forced myself up on one knee as Magnus launched Cheryl over the battlefield, backwards, through the safety glass of an office front. Oh, Jesus! I struggled on my feet. Ultra Magnus had to be stopped before we were all killed. My adrenaline wore off, and suddenly I could feel the shattered bones of my ribs grating against the armor meant to protect me. Shit! I gasped into the mic. I'm... I'm hurt! I collapsed again to the pavement. I could see, but no longer had the strength to move. I couldn't breathe enough to talk. Harold was still in the crater, unconscious or dead. I didn't know. Stephen was down, also unconscious. Cheryl hadn't extricated herself from the rubble where she lay. A wide pool of blood spread out around her twisted legs. Maria was still standing off to the side, too terrified to move. Ultra Magnus closed in on her. Oh, God, help me! She tried to run, but he was too fast. Someone, please! He had Maria by the neck, lifted almost nine feet off the ground. Her legs kicked wildly, but didn't even touch his chest. I heard her neck crunching like the sound of dry branches stomped underfoot. She went limp, and he tossed her aside like a toddler might throw a suddenly boring Raggedy Ann doll. He turned towards me. I knew his face from years of service as his ally. Who are you? he snarled. He tugged me off the ground by my armored collar. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't tell him I'd trained with him ten years ago, served with him on the backup team in Chicago, did a one-year tour under his command in Dallas. I couldn't beg him for mercy. Who sent you? Let him go, Magnus! I turned. The rest of the Miami team joined him then. Johnny Proton, their energy manipulator, grabbed Magnus's arm. We're supposed to work as a team. They were nothing. My vision went dim as the pain in my chest began to shut me down. I felt the street slam into the back of my head. Union medevac helicopters dropped from the sky, drowning all other sounds until there was nothing but the thunder of their whirling blades. I was slipped onto a gurney and lifted carefully into the choppers. Nova sat beside me his ancient face hair exuding pride beneath a pate of dyed blonde hair. This had all been his idea. Well done, he said, just as we'd hoped. The pain subsided. Sleep easy, Johnny boy. I could hear his voice, like the whistle and groan of a far-off train. We'll take care of everything now. Five. I stared down from the mezzanine over the village commons area. Dread radiated up from the small group of card players and puzzle assemblers and TV watchers. The union said this was the best place for me for the time being. A Senate subcommittee on union activities put on a nice long show hearing for the normals. Nova and the others sang and danced around the robbery, the property damage, the deaths, like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. The union had plausible deniability and managed to shape it, like clay, into a sculpture of heroism worthy of a Hollywood blockbuster. The luminaries blamed the media for blowing things out of proportion, for having an axe to grind. I watched the hearings from my hospital room, but the morphine and the plaster cast kept me from laughing at the ridiculousness of it all. I'd gotten off lucky with four broken ribs, a bruised pelvis, punctured lung, and a ruptured spleen. Maria, Stephen, and Cheryl were dead. Harold couldn't move a muscle from the neck down, but we weren't the only casualties. Neither was the truth. Village security footage showed Sindel slipping into her iridescent red unitard, yellow cape, and fitted eye mask before stepping into the heat lock. The staff recovered her frozen body 200 yards from the entrance. She left a note that said only, Fuck you. Ultra Magnus did the same, only more dramatically, in space, and on live TV. Rumors spread that he was hearing voices. Another depressed team leader. The Union wouldn't be filling his costume with another body, at least not in the short term. Ultra Magnus was a martyr now, propped up on his comic book image, a hero's hero. They already had a statue to him in the Great Hall. I looked down at the villagers from the railing. I didn't know all their names yet, but I would in time. And when they came to me with problems, I'd lie to them, just like I was supposed to. 
and tell them all they had to do was sign up for training, that the union would take care of everything. The invitation was always open. The world would always need new heroes. The machine would always need grease. The grinder would always need new meat. And that was our story. If you're still itching for more in the Union Dues universe, then try not to scratch. We've already picked up the third story, Baby in the Bathwater, and it'll be out sometime in the next couple of months. This will be a short back end. I had an announcement written up and even recorded on an exciting new escape pod feature. One of particular interest, say, to parents who might have a problem with their kids hearing stories like this one, in which necks crunch and heroes commit savage, spectacular suicide. But, A, things turned out not to be quite ready at the last minute, and B, it's just now occurred to me that a lot of those parents might not be listening this far in. So we'll get that launched in the next few days. You can keep checking our blog at escapepod.org for an early announcement, and talk about it in depth next week. Meanwhile, some of you have probably noticed that this is escape pod number 49. 7 squared. Very lucky number. We've got number 50 coming up next week. Do we have anything special planned? Eh, kind of. But one thing I'd like to start doing, starting next week and continuing on, is opening up a bit and playing a bit more feedback. To that end, if you have comments on a particular story, on Escape Pod in general, on how bad I am at women's voices, I'm actively encouraging you to submit them. You can leave comments on our blog, or call our voicemail line at 206-666-EPOD, or send a message to our new address, feedback at escapepod.org. Unlike the editor address, anything you send to feedback could get played back on the next podcast. Will we podcast every comment? No. I don't want this to become the sort of podcast where we have to have a separate hour-long show every week just for voicemail. Hi, Mike. Hi, Evo. We'll never spend more than a few minutes at a time on it, which probably means a lot of things won't get played. But it's all important to us, and you never know. So give it a shot. Escape Pod is released on a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. This means that these recordings will never get old. You can keep on sharing them forever, and I hope you will. Our music is by permission of Dai Kaiju, friend to children everywhere. And if you get that reference, then the joke is pretty much complete. That was our show for this week. Our quote to round out the story comes from Abraham Lincoln. He said, Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. We'll see you next week. Meanwhile, have fun. Have fun.